Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is our property repair and maintenance webinar. Um, I'm joined by Joel from Mill Architects and Nikki from ESPC Lettings. And these are our experts on hand today who will be providing you with as much information as possible and answering your pre-submitted questions. So of course, thank you to those who did submit questions in advance. What we've done is we've tried to group them um, together and answer as much as possible. But if you find there's something that we've not covered that you want to ask us as the event goes on, please feel free to just pop it in the Q&A box down at the bottom of the webinar and we'll do our best to get around to those at the very end. Um, my name is Karen. I work on the ESPC marketing team. So if there's any questions that you want to follow up with after the event, please feel free to email myself at marketing at ESPC.com. And to kick us off, we're going to pass over to Joe, who is going to give us a run through and introduction to what the webinar is about. OK, hi, everyone. My name is Joe Parigedis. I work for Mill Architects. Um, and ESPC have asked me to um, do a short presentation to you all about property uh, repair and maintenance. We have, um, I think for the last 15 years, run property repair events in the ESPC in person. Um, and we've kind of moved things a wee bit more online. Um, but it's it's a really current topic. Um, one of the main things about looking after your property, of course, is that if you make everything wind and water tight, you're doing your first part in the Save the Planet situation of making it all thermally efficient. Um, and this is step one in terms of making making us do that. So the purpose of my talk to you briefly today is to help property owners become aware of the condition of their properties, uh, to help owners start the process of either repair or maintenance, uh, to make owners aware of proposals in Parliament to change the law regarding property repair, that's quite important, and generally to provide an awareness of what information um, there is out there and there is getting more information out there. Very briefly, tenements. People have a kind of misconstrued idea of what a tenement is, but ultimately it's classed as any building divided into two or more parts horizontally and that is communal ownership. So whether you have a ground floor of a house and top floor of a house, you know, it's classed as a tenement. So back in the day, uh, the Romana Dutch law made it possible to purchase airspace so we could start building high in our cities. And that's what we did. We built very high. Um, and, and all through Scotland, uh, the cities became quite crowded and we had lots of stone and we had lots of stone quarries. We have a lot less stone quarries now. So that's why we were able to do that. Tenements come in different styles. We have a pre-World War. We have uh, older brick and render flats, mainly social housing, built between 1920 and 1940. You've got your high rises, they're communal, they're tenements as well, 60s to 80s, and you have modern estates as well. So I just thought I'd put in a, a few photos of different types of tenements. You can see you can get a um, tenement but at, at the back of a property, or you can go through a communal close, or you can. Uh, you, you have red sandstone in Glasgow, you have a more yellow sandstone in Edinburgh. There's lots of different types of tenements that you can have and more common ones in smaller towns are of course the shop fronts on the bottom and then a couple of flats above and that's your communal ownership there. So there's been quite a few historical tenement disasters, unfortunately. <laughs> um, here's an image uh, in 1861 where a seven storey ten tenement came crashing down, killing 35 people. We had the Great Fire of Edinburgh, which basically just roared through all of the closes um, of the old town and destroyed quite a lot of buildings. Um, obviously, people lost their lives, families lost their homes. And so we started to take note of that, note of the fact that high rise and close living um, is a problem. And we started to do stuff about that. We started to put in fire protection measures, stuff like that to, to assist with terms of it not spreading. However, we still have current tenement disasters. Um, many of our properties, especially in Edinburgh, are in a, a, a poor and dangerous condition. Um, it tends to be linked to the age of the building, plus the type of maintenance, repairs, maybe inappropriate yet good intention cement repairs in the past have been used. Um, but there are fatalities um, that have occurred in the city because of falling masonry and 
you know, we, we really have to be mindful of that, that it's our responsibility if we own the property to make sure that doesn't happen. So in 2021, the City of Edinburgh Council attended to an average of over 20 falls of height of masonry um, every month. That's a lot, isn't it? Um, and it's still still going high, I'm afraid. Um, top left-hand side is Ryan's Bar, where a waitress was killed. Uh, a skew coat fell down, uh, hitting the conservatory roof and killing her. Um, the bottom right image is it happened on a I was on a site, I had a project uh, live on site, and this happened across the road while I was on site. It's not ideal. Um, and we have lots of uh, we have lots of good harness stonemasons in our town, uh, the likes of Stuart Engster, Edinburgh stonemasons, who will um, go around in his harness and take uh, dangerous bits of stone at high level off to make you safe. So, owners' responsibilities. Owners are jointly responsible with their co-owners to maintain the common parts of the tenement, which are those that provide support and shelter. So there's a mutual responsibility for the parts that are shared by only some owners. So it's all to do with what's in your deeds. Maybe you'll have mutual chimneys on one side um, that your other side of neighbours won't, won't have to share. But So you really have to determine what's on your deeds and what you agree with your neighbours in terms of how you repair things. But this can lead to problems when owners are attempting to carry out repairs to their own properties. Uh, and there can, there can be some disagreements. I've seen them. It's not pretty. In owners' meetings over who pays for what. So here you have common problems in a tenement. Yet all the pink dots are all problems that you can get. Uh, now, we don't expect you to learn them all today. But I think the point is to be aware that you need to look up high, don't you, at your buildings just to see what's going on with them. Uh, there's stuff that you can deal with in your own flat or in your common close, like your windows, etc. But up on your roof and up on your chimneys, you need to be a wee bit aware of that. So why is it so important to look after your building? Uh, because in Edinburgh, they're, 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 they're quite poor in poor condition. Not just Edinburgh, Glasgow's bad, Perth is literally falling down. Uh, lots of things uh, need to change for, for, for repairs to building to become a lot easier. In, in, in many cases, it's not the property um, owner's fault because they can't get up onto the roof, uh, they can't see the conditions of their chimneys, um, but it is good to have an awareness of the condition of your property. Um, and of course, if you have an awareness and you maintain your, bin, your building, then you, you won't have huge costs later with a massive repair, as it were. Uh, we want to look after buildings so we don't have any water ingress. Uh, we don't want escalating repair costs. And also, if you maintain and increase the property's value, then it's minimal risk to a new buyer. And that becomes quite important later on when I talk briefly about the parliamentary changes. So consequences if you do not maintain your property. Um, a leaking downpipe can be easily fixed. I pulled an iron brew can out of the top of one a few years ago, and that had been blocked for years, apparently. The owner had actually built a separate wall to prevent the water coming in. So um, absolutely no need to do that. Just doesn't have to be hugely expensive, doesn't have to be onerous, but if you don't deal with it, you will end up with rotten timber beams like you're seeing on the bottom right corner. Um, and then that does become extremely expensive. Uh, this is a wee flat that I worked on in, in Wrestleg, and there was, there was just a, a a tear, as you can see at the end in the middle, a photo on the felt roof. Water came through it over 10, 15 years. Enormous amounts of dry rot, cost over £20,000 to fix. Didn't, that didn't need to happen. Um, so leaking gutters, uh, defective stones, all this is caused by lack of maintenance. So you can have storm damage. Uh, all of these pictures I have taken um, from sites that I have got to, which is just lack of maintenance. Uh, you can see there's no felt underneath the slate, so if they slip, that water is just going right into the right into the attic or the top floor property. Uh, these are all uh, photos of projects that I've worked on, um, stone decay, chimneys, um, mullions and balustrades at a high level, just in really bad condition. Cement's very bad, don't use cement. We don't like it, it's too hard for stone. It doesn't let stone breathe, 
And as a result, the stone deteriorates and turns into sand around it, and you're just left with the hard cement. So there's cement everywhere. That's how they repaired all the buildings in the 80s. And it was very well intentioned at the time, but it has basically now knackered all of our buildings. And uh, a lot of stone falls, et cetera, are caused by cement repairs becoming loose. Um, but you can repair, you can repair your stone. Uh, this is uh, top left is a line of stone used a lot in Glasgow. Again, doesn't let the stone breathe. So if you don't let the stone breathe, you can see in the purple highlighted area here, um, that what then happens is your water just fills in to your wall, saturates it, and it starts to hit stuff like lath and plaster, and obviously your lath is timber, and then that creates rot. Um, this is pretty, uh, but don't do it, because it's very bad for your building, and all the roots get in the joints and destroy your stone, so don't let your building get to that stage. Um, and this is a project I did uh, just on Royal Terrace, um, I could just remove these balustrades with my hands um, and I am as weak as a kitten. So if that had fallen on, on someone's head, I, I don't think that would have gone down very well. So anyway, we got these repaired and they were grand. So how to ensure minimum problems with your, your property or fix any problems that you have. So number one, make the building safe. So um, you carry out an inspection. Um, we would advise that you either a, well, to be honest, you would advise that you just get a professional advisor on board, whether that's a building surveyor, a accredited or, or an architect who's accredited, but someone who knows what they're doing, someone who works with buildings of a traditional nature, and they can give you an impartial report. There's no point calling a contractor because he'll just come up with lots of different things that need done um, and you won't get like for like quotes. If you have an independent survey carried out, then you know the condition of your property. The condition might be absolutely fine, or it might just need a couple of things done here, or it could need enormous repairs, but it's better to know now um, than later. And of course, things aren't as simple because neighbours can be unresponsive. It generally comes down to one person trying to sort stuff out for a stair, and that can be excruciatingly painful. Um, but if you do appoint a professional, then they can try and make that kind of action plan and process a lot easier for you. There's changes of foot. Um, it's going to take a while, but it's this has been ongoing for the last decade. And I think in the next few years, things are going to start really moving with this. So there is a motion in Parliament at the moment, and um, the Law Association are currently looking at legal documents to put forward to Parliament uh, to change what well, is actually number two that they're planning to make law which is establishing compulsory owners associations. So that means that everyone in your steer group has to get together as a group, create a bank account and create an association together. And from that, that means that you can then put in um, compulsory uh, sinking funds. You might put 50 quid in a month or hundred pounds a month for maintenance for your property. You buy a property of this age, you have to maintain it. You have to allow for maintaining that. In Europe, large parts of Europe, it's a legal requirement that you have to put a minimum amount of a certain amount into a bank account so that you can look after your building. But the one um, that I'm most interested in that I think will make the most difference is um, that tenement inspection should be carried out every five years. So this is not your home report because your home report, you know, it's not giving you what's really going on. This is a proper in-depth it's called a quinquennial inspection. Now, churches um, have to have these quinquennial inspection reports done um, by law. They, they always have done. Um, and they have to submit that to their various churches or, or dioceses or whatever. So the plan is here that there will be an accredited professional who will prepare a report, which will then be topped up every five years, revised, altered, and that will go in with the home report. It will be supplementary to your home report. Um, and you won't be able to buy or sell your property unless you actually have one of these reports carried out, a bit like your home report, really. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on at the moment to make things compulsory, and I think we should all just be quite aware of that. Uh, I've had a few clients come to me already saying, can we just get this report done so that we know where we are? Because you shouldn't really be doing it just because it's law. You should be doing it because you want to know the condition of the property that you live in and know what the responsibilities are for you, for you repairing that. So we would advise to get a professional. 
the RIS and the RICS have websites with accredited professionals uh, who know what they're talking about, who can help, who can advise on what contractors to use, who can advise that you, you go out to tender, you get the best value for money, um, or at the very, very least, just do a report for you and let you know, you know what's going on. The, um, the council's very good, Edinburgh Council. I've got a shared repaired service. Um, it's a very good service. They, they do do inspections, although they prefer not to do those inspections. They prefer the property owners to um, get an external consultant to do that. Um, they have a lot of advice on their website. Uh, Under One Roof is a fantastic website. Um, which is has been worked away on for the last six years and it literally has every question you want to know some wonderful sketches and it just gives you a wealth of knowledge and there's a new app that has been developed called Novaville and that app has been launched in Edinburgh for about a year I think there's something like five or six hundred tenements that have signed up to using it um, and if everyone if everyone in your blocks you know signs up to the app it's a free app to download um, that you then are able to set up bank accounts through the app, pay contractors through the app, um, get a consultant through the app. So the, the aim is that we're trying to make this easier and easier for you um, as, as we go along. So our message this lunchtime is to look after your property and prevent water ingress, defective roofs, falling masonry and internal damage and minimise your repair and maintenance costs. Okay, that's me. Brilliant, thank you so much, Joe. That was really informative. And if anyone has any questions on what they have just seen or would like us, or I should say Joe rather, to explain something in a little bit more detail, feel free to pop that in our Q&A box. And if we can, we'll try and get around to it before the end of the webinar. So right now we'll move on to our Q&A and we'll start again with Joe. Um, the first question is, what kind of routine inspections or checks should I do to avoid problems in the first place? Okay, so we've talked a wee bit about the, the reports, haven't we? The conditional report, which is a good start for 10 in my eyes. As, as, a, as a consultant, um, if someone comes to me with a property, I would always say, just, can, just let me do an inspection so I can get to know this building and understand what's going on with it. Um, so, so that's the kind of overall holistic approach to your property. Um, other routine inspections are clear out your gutters. Don't let the grass grow or a tree grow in them. Uh, make sure your downpipes are, are running free. Uh, when it's raining, go outside and have a look at whether you've got leaking joints in your gutters or your downpipes. Um, so we would say clean out your downpipes and look at your slates, uh, get them checked every year and repair any missing. Um, or slipped ones and of course that depends on the accessibility but there there are a, quite a lot of harness guys out there now who can do stuff like that and you can also get cherry pickers and stuff to do it so those are the two main things that I would that I would check. Brilliant thank you and Nikki the next questions for yourself is there anything I can do to maximize how much rent I can charge? Um, hi, thanks everyone for coming along today. Um, yeah, so maximising rent. So I understand that that is a big driver for lots of people, um, potential buy-to-let investors, landlords, obviously wanting to achieve as much rent as possible. But as Joe has suggested, it's not all about getting as much money as possible, but maintaining your property and make sure it's, it's looked after. Um, so sometimes that work that you might be carrying out at your rental property isn't going to equate into being able to get more rent um, but what it will do is increase the desirability of your property because what you will have is um, a property that's well maintained and well presented that's going to be attractive to tenants and therefore increase the likelihood of getting let quicker reducing your void periods um, and probably getting a more desirable tenant so there may be advantages in terms of you know you get an income um, that you might not if the property wasn't of a great standard. Um, every property will have its ceiling, so it doesn't matter how much you might spend on a one bedroom flat in lease, it's always going to have a ceiling. Um, but of course, there is an element of work that you can do that will push it to the top of that ceiling um, rather than kind of, you know, kind of leave it middle ground. Um, and those are things like 
new kitchens, new bathrooms, things that will just set you apart from the competition. So my advice would always be really is to check how much more that's going to affect the rent before plowing in lots of money into a project because the financial return of what you may be putting in isn't always directly um, returned in terms of the rent you can achieve so it's about kind of setting those limits um, and seeing where things are at so it's always good to have a well-maintained property you know it's looking as good as it can so it can achieve as much as it can but I would just be aware that everything is going to have its ceiling the same same as anything else really. Brilliant thank you. Jo, the next question is for you. How do I find the right tradespeople? Okay, so I guess it depends what you want to get done. If you want to uh, do some external work, uh, then I would advise that you you do that through your professional advisor and um, use someone who they have used for uh, many years and uh, they can be guided. Um, otherwise, you are at risk of a contractor just turning up and, you know, just doing doing whatever they fancy without you actually knowing what they're doing, um, if you're getting any guarantees from it and, and, and what's happening. In terms of just general trades people, um, there's various um, checktrader.com and all these, these places that, that you can go to for approved contractors. Now, if you use the Novaville app, on that app has, and it's very good actually, it's got a list of um, all the tradespeople um, that are approved and it's actually got reviews of all those tradespeople that previously people have used. So say you put a Novaville app, uh, you've got it because you need a new, a new front closey door and a lock, right, for example, and that's what you do. Then you would put that request into the app to say I need a new front door and I need a new lock. And then you would send it out to it would come up with suggestions of people to use and you would send that out to people and they would all give you a cost. But on um, the reviews, it does tell you, and most of them, most of them on the app have five stars. And that's just quite comforting to know that that's how you can actually find, find trades people. So I would download the app. Yeah, yeah, I would just say as well, for, for landlords, if you're using a management agent, they'll have regular contractors as well that we you know we use on a on a regular basis that are reliable so you know you should be able to 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 use them too mm -hmm. and factors as well nikki if mm -hmm. you're if you're yeah. and i know that's not a glasgow thing but um if your property is factored then they will have people on their books mm -hmm. thank you okay nikki the next question is for you what um, is the best way to decorate a flat that you're trying to rent out? Um, just keep it fresh and neutral and clean. Um, so it's a nice, bright, airy space when anybody goes in to view the property. Um, you might want to dress it for viewings, for photographs. So kind of have beds made and soft furnishings and, you know, all those extra bits that that make it look look pretty if you like um during that process um but i would recommend keeping the actual furniture to a minimum um so this will make the property appear more spacious rather than having lots of furniture cluttered in um, and allows tenants to bring their own things people have more of their own things now the days of people arriving just with their suitcase with their clothes in and you know needing everything else are kind of long gone so tenants have their own things so keeping things to a minimum minimum allows them to bring in their own items make it more homely hopefully they will stay longer um, and then I would just remove any kind of clutter or or personal items that that belong to to you or that have been accrued over several tenancies you know you just want it to be a nice fresh bright appealing space thank you okay Joel uh, the next question is for yourself is there any particular type of insurance to help us in saving costs during repairs okay so no <laughs> ultimately you need to look after your property now whether that's jointly or individually or whatever it is if your chimney falls down in a storm and it falls down because it's full of cement and it's not pointed correctly and your pots are loose and um, which the insurance company will pretty much confirm is the case uh, you you won't you won't get anything. You, the insurance companies will not pay out for uh, neglect, which is basically what you're doing if you're not looking after your um, 
your properties. Um, one interesting thing to note that no one has in the city is joint insurance. So as a, as a block of flats, it is actually law that you have um, a, a joint buildings insurance. And, but that's more to protect from, you know, one of the previous, you know, tenement disasters that I was talking about in terms of a fire or a collapse, uh, which isn't down to a lack of maintenance or neglect of the property. Um, so, no, no, you can't get around it with insurance payouts, I'm afraid. Thank you. And the final one of our pre-submitted questions. So if this doesn't cover um, what you are um, wanting to expand on, I would suggest popping a question in the Q&A box now and we can try and get around to it. Um, but otherwise, Nikki, the final question is, what are the most common concerns that tenants have when looking at flats to rent and that we as landlords can help with? Um, yeah, sure. So I, what I would say is probably one of the main concerns for tenants is damp, mould, condensation. We're often working with lots of tenants that are moving out wherever they might be looking for a new property. And the reason that they're doing that is because there's damp in a property and their landlord maybe isn't responding to it um, and things are just getting worse. It affects their health. Um, and it seems to be a, a real problem in Edinburgh just now. Um, so if you have, if anything is kind of brought to your attention in connection with any of these damp or mold issues, um, then I would say, you know, get onto that get that resolved um, and get to the root of the problem to try and resolve it because tenants are, are really really keen on that um, that that's not going to be an issue and if it is left the tenants aren't going to stay you know they're going to move on and then you're just going to have this rolling kind of nobody wants to stay so I would say that that's a main kind of issue that that they have and um, when looking at properties is is has there been any history of damp is there any mold in the property so if you've got anything going on like that definitely um, have it looked at windows especially you know older properties can be drafty and um, so looking after your windows both internally and externally is important and something that that tenants tend to ask about at viewings um outdated furniture appliances um i mean if as a rule of thumb if you wouldn't have it in your home then probably don't leave it in your rental property you know it is going to be somebody's home you want them to look after it you want to maximize your rent so anything that's kind of dated look at replacing with something that's 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 new and functional um cleanliness again that'll be your tenant's responsibility but if you found yourself with a vacant property then maybe take the time to do a really good deep spring clean you know so everything looks great uh, and the same with with gardens um again a tenant's responsibility but if between tenancies you've got time to get in and make sure everything is looking really good hedges are trimmed back the trees are trimmed back it's it's looking good and you, you're stepping off on the right foot for, for tenants moving in fantastic thank you both for the um questions and answers there um so we've got two questions before we finish up um, which is great for timing. The first of which is, is the property rentable if it doesn't have gas heating and is the cost of maintaining electric heating higher compared to gas central heating? Um, so I can jump in. Um, so electric heating always used to get uh, a bit of a bad press and people used to be kind of, oh, if it hasn't got gas central heating, I'll never be able to rent out my property. And I would say of late, um, you know, in recent years, then the tide has definitely turned in favour of electric heating. I mean, those big not very attractive storage heaters that you know you might be cold if you get in from work tonight so you'll put it on and you'll get some heat tomorrow then they're probably still not great but there are so many more newer central heating systems that can be installed whether they're just individual panel heaters or central heating that's electric run and that's a much more effective um, and it is becoming more attractive to tenants and they only have one bill um, so they're not having to pay gas and electric so they can maybe just budget a little easier and kind of generally speaking it's a little bit better for the environment um so yeah the tide is turning um is what i would say um so if you're looking at maybe buying a property and it doesn't have you know it only has electric heating then that's not the worst thing in the world but what i would say is if it is only electric is make sure 
it's of a good standard and, and that it is, you know, efficient because that's that's what people would be looking for. Brilliant. Thank you. And um, the last question, it looks as if um, this person would like some advice. So they're saying, without the law, I am finding it difficult to get a consensus of other owners to give, oh, sorry, to even get simple things done. For example, change a bulb, clean up the common area. Um, are there any methods to get them engaged and agreed? Can I get this done? For example, get the stair cleaned at my cost to make sure the house um, rents well. So it's a difficult one, isn't it? Trying to engage your neighbours, knocking on the door, half of them are rented, half of them are Airbnb, although maybe not allowed to be anymore. Um, so it is difficult getting everyone on board. And sadly, it is down to one person, you know, knocking on the doors. I, I would maybe suggest the app, you know, um, if you can even just post something through their letterbox to say, if you download this app, you know, we have to look up after our properties, um, you know, because the app, although it is, I'd say it's actually more designed for smaller things like that, for lighting, for doors, for locks. I have a meeting with Novaville next week um, in an attempt to try and make it, you know, for larger repairs so that things can be more manageable. So the, the Novaville app, um, I would, I would, I don't know if the ESPC can maybe email out details of that to Definitely. people. Um, if um, you, I would just say, please get in touch with me at marketing at mm -hmm. And I'm sure Joe mm -hmm. can give me a link or something that I can, can forward yeah, on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, it's, it's a very interesting one. And, and the whole thing is it's designed with ease, but ultimately you're going to have, you're going to get, you know, difficult characters. Um, the, the law says that if you have 51% majority, then you can carry out the repairs. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get the money from those people um, who don't necessarily want to. Now, if it's a larger repair, then you can take things a step further. You know, you can, um, through the Tenement Act, you can do various things, send various letters and get their flat blacklisted and stuff like that. But if we're just talking about cleaning the close and putting a light in, you know, that, that is difficult. I just wonder if there is a way of uh, trying to get everyone together with this app to make it easier. Because with the app, then you don't have to speak to each other, you don't have to see each other. You know, there's no owners meetings or anything like that where people run out in tears, which they do. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's kind of, it's kind of like a faceless thing. And of course, if, if the, uh, I think Edinburgh Council as well give out details uh, of who owns what uh, flats now. I think they're allowed to do that. Uh, so it could be worth getting in touch as well if you, you know, if she's got a bunch of students in your in your block pool rent, then that's not particularly useful. Brilliant. No, that's really helpful. And just to echo what Joe said, please do get in touch if you want any more information or if there's um, some more advice you'd like. Um, I can pass you on to either Nikki or Joe, or I can um, try my best to provide you with the answers and links um, myself. Um, but other than that, thank you so much for coming along and joining us today. Of course, a huge thank you to Joe and Nikki for being our experts. Um, that was really fantastic. And thank you for submitting the questions for making this a really um, engaged and informative webinar. So thank you again. And please, if you have time, fill out the survey that will pop up once this webinar ends. And like I said, if there's anything else, please get in touch and keep an eye out for webinars in the future. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. See ya. Thanks, guys. Bye.